Hey, John. Thanks for taking the time. It's tech it season. So that's always a time where there are lots of news are being shared about the SAP ecosystem and what SAP is all about. Um, it's, of course, still COVID, so it's happening in a virtual setting. I remember the two of us typically, you know, decompressing just after the, after the show at the party. So I figured, why not, you know, just come together and do that and, and sort of have a yeah, conversation and some early thoughts on what SAP shared with the world and, and, and take it from there. So I'm really happy to have you. Yeah, it's uh, when you and I were talking about this, we were like, yeah, we're going to have our tech discussion. Well, why don't we just tape it? <laughs> That, that seems like an old school thing to do, right? And um, I don't really want to know how many combined tech eds you and I have been to. That would be really oh scary. Uh, I, th I think 30 would be the low end, but I think it's much more. Um, right. <laughs> but, you know, one, right. one, of the, one of the highlights was was pulling you aside and, like, having fierce debates about the future of, of SAP. And so even though our roles have dramatically changed since those times, I thought it would be, you know, fun to do this and just, you know, and, and we're taping this right after the developer keynote. Um, I, I qualify this as kind of an early reactions phase because there's announcements come out and then there's a whole lot of absorbing of that that has to happen. Um, so anyway, just for the listeners to know, you know, th these are really instant reactions. So this is not going to be the most like informed discussion of all time, but we're going to give it a go. Yeah. And as you said, the world has changed. The roles has changed. Um, but yeah, let's just make sure that we, you know, keep the conversation alive and, and see where it takes us. Um, so let's jump right at it. I think yesterday, um, Jürgen kicked it off, Jürgen Müller, the CTO, um, and basically framing the whole conversation and how SAP and, and in particular the SAP business technology platform addresses some of the challenges that he sees out there. So he had a strange ordering on these things. So he started, of course, with the move to the cloud and keeping the core clean as the number one. And then following up on, on saying that the climate change that is needed in the world is, is definitely much bigger than um, the COVID situation that we f face. And then he ended it up with, yeah, inequality of opportunities. And then he go, went into a little bit more specifics on all of these things, tying them together. Um, but yeah. Um, any any of those that are particularly interesting to you to start from? Should we start with the SAP angle and the and the keep the core clean type of thing? Keep the core clean. Yeah, I've been keep having some. Clean. I've been publishing on this lately. I've been having dialogue with the. I know you've read the piece I did with Scott Russell about that, the board member and how that's been an emphasis with partners, at least from SAP side. But I think there's also a lot of considerable skepticism about. <laughs> whether partners are going to be on board with the business model change. Um, I actually like SAP's messaging here a lot. I just think the change around this is, it's important to understand why the change, but the getting that real on the ground is a whole different story, a whole different can of worms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. And and I know it's a, it's a theme that we have been hearing for, I don't know, like the last two or three years. So I think hopefully everybody understands why SAP is stressing this so much to keep the core clean. But at the same time, they said, if you want to have it clearly separated, SAP standard code from custom code, you got to do side-by-side -side extensibility with the SAP technology platform, right? Um, and depending on which customer you're looking at, there could be a lot of custom code um, and, and you can't get rid of it from one day to the other. So there was a whole topic by itself. Um, that definitely falls into what you just said, how, how to make that happen, right? And, and I think they started to, yeah, at, at least give people a little bit more of flexibility towards this um, by by addressing, you know, and, and introducing what they call embedded steampunk, which is this very modern ABAP flavor that they had on the BTP for a while and are now offering as part of, you know, tightly embedded into the S4. So I can now do tightly coupled custom development stuff in 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 HANA itself in S4, and, and they they call the closing the gap, and I think that's at least they're you know <laughs> honest with that. You know? So yeah, I actually have a kind of a personal question for you because you were very active in the SAP Cloud Platform back in the day before it became the BTP. Yep. 
uh, and, and there were times where it felt like, you know, where's the love for the SAP cloud platform? And there was a lot of heartache in those days that a lot of passion put into that by that team. Uh, yeah. What does it feel like now to like see sort of like the level of commitment? Does it make you feel like, oh, yeah, I'm glad we were really scrapping and pushing this? Or do you feel like, oh, man, I, our, our contributions were really overlooked at the time? Like, what what is your feeling now looking at all this? I mean, I always knew early on that this is the opportunity of a lifetime, you know, to be part of that team that really incubated that thinking, that mindset and the platform itself into an old classic ERP vendor. So that's something that, you know, happens only one in your career. So that was big. Um, at the same time as the thing got bigger, right? Um, we lost a little bit the influence that we had in the early days as it became more and more strategic and, and the executives weighed in and, and everybody had an opinion on, on what it needs to do. So it got a lot more complex, everything. Um, I still see a lot of the stuff that we started um, being executed upon. So the SAP Discovery Center, um, this whole idea about, you know, give developers free access to it. I mean, that was a battle that I was really fighting very hard back in the back in the really early days with Neo, and it's now coming back with the free 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 tier. Um, so I think the the mindset is still there. Other topics that were really big when I was there, like business services, <laughs> remember that? I, I haven't heard a word on yeah. that one. So it seems to be that they, I don't know, at, at least not marketing it at, as prominently as back in the days. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, everything else is nicely coming together, I think. Um, and, and, and yeah, they're executing on, on the vision. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get a little torn with all of it because a part of me really, I've always liked SAP's technology vision, but then I get frustrated sometimes, uh, particularly in the cloud context where I feel like SAP's done way too much sort of uh, kind of like reinventing cloud technology instead of like, I'd like to hear SAP talk much more about multi-tenancy than they do. Uh, which is really the standard way that cloud architectures are built. Now you can get into some stuff around multi-instance, and um, but it's about economies of scale. It's not about creating your own version of the cloud. And I feel like SAP's done a lot of that over the years. But the the one interesting thing about the enterprise software market is that it does move slower than we'd like to think. Mm -hmm. And so SAP has an interesting way of kind of plugging away at stuff and getting it right, which I think like the free developer license we can get into in a bit is an example of that where – you know, on the one hand, it's like, yes, this is a great announcement. On the other hand, it's like so much heartache and so, so many conversations over the years to try to get that to that point. So yeah. it's an interesting thing. And you always want to throw under SAP under the bus on some level for like taking so long to get these things right. But then when you take a objective step back, you're kind of like, well, there's actually still a big opportunity here. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, with the clean core is an interesting example of that because what SAP is trying to do there here's how I see it. They they need a strong argument for why they should be involved in the cloud conversations with customers and not customers going directly to hyperscalers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hyperscalers and their partners are more than willing to take old SAP landscapes and simply lift and shift them to the cloud. Um, SAP doesn't want that for a variety of reasons, partially because they're going to be left out of those conversations. But also, and I think quite correctly, they're making the case that if you really want to modernize your business and, and, and compete in the kind of <laughs> winner slash loser economy that we have right now, this pandemic nightmare that we're trying to make our way through, uh, you're going to need uh, to modernize your platform. And, and SAP, I think, has been smart to realize that they have to continue to urge customers along that path. So you're not going to get to a clean core overnight if you have hundreds of thousands of customizations. But SAP's done a very, very good job of emphasizing why that still needs to be your long-term goal. And especially when you take into account things like that I know are close to your heart around things like workflow automation, low code, empowering business mm. users, things like that. You, you can't do that on these old legacy architectures and these old customized environments. It's not standard enough. And you certainly can't talk about AI and machine learning very effectively in that context either. So that's the push. And, and, and the gap that I think remains is the gap between the messaging, which is, I think, good messaging, 
Mm. Uh, and 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 on the ground, how are partners actually responding to this? Because I've talked with partners who are who have no intention of backing off from the money they get from customizations. And so the question then becomes like, how accountable will they be to this new approach? And you know, but I do think SAP leadership is very very determined to get there. So we'll see. Yeah, and some good points, right? I think this whole topic of the hyperscalers taking the big ERP workloads these days. I think SAP tried to mitigate their personal risk in this with with Rice, right? So that they have yep. at least parts in this conversations. And then the other thing that you said that I think about a lot these days is it's you said winners and losers. While the initial idea about you know cloud platform and, and platforms in general is this thinking of saying it's it's a positive sum game. You know, the more people that are having a vested interest in the success, the bigger the pie becomes for all of them. And 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 now that you mentioned the partners, um, that was another thing that I liked in the keynote is there was no word on on partners and and, and their role of it. It was just very focused on what what SAP brings to the table. And and mm-hmm. and now in my new role, obviously that's something that I'm very passionate about. Of course, is to say. Where's the partner opportunities in all this? Because there's so many partners that have a really, really big interest in seeing SAP succeed and helping SAP on on that. As as Thomas Auer Essig once stressed again on this on this battlefield of getting the customers to move to S4, they said they want to leave nobody behind. But ultimately, mm-hmm. any partner, because of the size of SAP's portfolio. You know that there will be somebody where you're somewhat competing with, and somehow you have to balance that out. And, and that still seems to be something that, you know, they they need to get better at, um, and then also get better in 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 articulating how partnerships could look like. And when I say this, I'm meaning beyond just the big five SIs out there. Right? What's the mm. what's the what's the the situation for the rest of us? Well, that's totally true because the. You know, I was talking with the user group the other day about a program they were planning, an event. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do with my SAP coverage, I don't have time I, to live and breathe SAP all the time like I used to, but I'm trying to stay in much closer contact with the big user groups. In fact, I'm interviewing the UK ISUG uh, chair on Friday because they have a big upcoming event. They've just done a big study on RISE. But I was talking with the user group about, like, an upcoming event and i said are you going to showcase the partners and what the partners are doing and my big reason for that is i think that partners are uniquely able to do some things that sap is not as good at and th- there's 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 two examples like sap is really good at helping customers who are ready to transform into a big s4 migration but for a lot of customers the business case for that's not there right now and so and 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 then even if it is there the, with the business technology platform, there's so much opportunity to build industry-specific enhancements uh, that that are really powerful and really bring the power of what you can do on S4 Honda to light. And then it, when you go to the so-called legacy install base, which is really an unfair word, but you know companies that are not on the S4 journey yet, mm. they need they have a lot of pain and they have a lot of opportunity in their chosen markets. Just because they're legacy on SAP doesn't mean they're legacy businesses. <laughs> They just have some older software in certain areas. And and I think SAP hat doesn't spend as much time on those customers because they, they're trying to focus them on this journey forward. And 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 yet there's a lot of partners that are really serving the need to those customers and saying, look, I can help you automate this or that that now. I can help you with with your low code tooling right now. I can I can help you with uh, DevOps automation and SAP context right now before you move. And and I think that's really good for SAP because what it does is it keeps the investment in the SAP environment rather than getting the customer starting to think about, well, maybe I should just rip and replace this thing because it's not doing anything that I want. So I get frustrated with SAP on this point because there's a lot of, when I talk with the leadership, there's a lot of talk about including smaller partners. But then when you get to these shows, there's no sign of and and so my question is, if you're so committed to the smaller partners, then you really have to put them on stage and show what they can do. Uh, and yeah, the big partners can do some cool stuff too. But I I just have a bias towards smaller partners just because. Um, and 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 look, I mean, a company like yours isn't even all that small anymore, to be honest. 
but but the point is you guys have ambition and aggression in the market because you have to <laughs> you know uh and you, you don't have a bunch of a fortune 100 companies that you've worked with for 20 years that you can go back to uh you have to earn the market every day and i just i just think customers deserve to see a, a range of partners in front of them and so i'm going to bug sap about this with sapphire coming up because it's my usual thing like put them on stage yeah. Yeah, please, please do so. And I think there will be a lot of partners out there that would be cheering uh, for you on that front. Um, okay, but, I have a burning uh, question for you now. Hmm? I have a burning question for you now, okay. which is which is like five years ago, you would have heard like no talk of low code at a SAP Tech Head show, none. Uh-huh. And, and, and yet there was, even five years ago, there was a lot of tooling that would qualify as some form of no code or low code today, right? Like, let's face it, the buzzwords are all the rage, but some of the tooling in some form has been around for a while. Um, so what is your take on this? Like, what is the power of this? Why now? Uh, just your reactions to all of that, because we heard a lot about AppGyver today, uh, which SAP acquired in the last year. What is your feeling about all of this right now? On a very high level, I hear a lot of the same mindset that you know we have here at Neptune Software when it comes to these tables. Um, and and for the record, for the people that know me, I've been as you know hesitant and as skeptical as many um, uh, in the market about what's the role of no code, low code. But but the the tools have changed a lot, right? And and what if if I go back to all of the acquisitions that SAP did in the past, uh, typically from Israel, right? We, we had Visual Composer. Um, that was the composite application development framework. Um, we had that Cockhead acquisition that was then re- relabeled to River and all that. So the thinking was there, but the but the tooling was somewhat limited because it was like always meta meta model driven. So I, I had a lot of productivity gains at the beginning, but then typically at this eighty percent mark, I, I hit the point where I wanted to do something that maybe the tool was not really anticipating. And then I had a hard, hard time making that, getting that in there or working around it. Um, so from that perspective, the tools have become much more sophisticated. And at the same time, what got more and more important, and, and Jürgen Müller also said, every company becomes a tech company. It's true. I think the data points that I've seen is that in the last year was the first year ever where the non-tech companies hired more developers than the big tech organizations, because everybody knows I need developers, but they're really, really scarce resource. So you need to ultimately think of it, how can I empower the tech savvy business experts that I have in my organization and help them contribute to this demand of applications we see in the business. I mean, the way I see it, this is exactly what what Marilyn Pratt fought for all the time, right? When he says, you need to give the BPXers a space in this community. And I think it's about time that we give them a seat at the table. And the way I look at it, it's just the natural progression from DevOps, where we realized, you know, separating engineering from operations doesn't fly. So why, why, why keep business and IT separated? I think this concept of saying having cross-functional teams where you develop, build, roll out, and own your parts, your service, your product, mm-hmm. your module, whatever it is together, seems to be one um, that seems favorable to just address this need for developers. And I think this is where the no-code, low-code space comes in. Um, and at a very high level, I think SAP really understood the need and, and, and understand what needs to be done. But as you said, it's they're, they're, they're doing it now with a, with a fresh restart using AppGyver and, and mixing it up with some of the stuff they already had. So. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an element of potential confusion around the roadmap and all the different tools. I think SAP is trying to clear that up. I personally find the list of various tools and use cases a little bit daunting on the surface. But, you know, one thing that's really interesting that I think you've done a good job of writing about, you've, you've actually done some of this on our site, Diginomica as well, mm-hmm. but um, is is kind of clarifying what this all means because, you know, some of the low code revolutionaries are frankly a pain in my ass because they talk about like, oh, you know, you're gonna, you know, you don't, you're not gonna need developers anymore, and business users are gonna build beautiful apps, and I think that's so much BS. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, I do, I'm a huge believer in like this workflow automation thing and kind of empowering business users to do so much more to 
to build their own workflows than they've ever done in the past. And then, but what what I think you've pointed out, which is really interesting, is how developers benefit from this kind of thing too, because it this distinction that this is only to empower business users, I think, is totally wrong. I think right. a lot of these a lot of these tools are designed to stop developers from having to like, you know, build the same building blocks every time and focus on really the creative aspects of development, which is where the real differentiation and business value is, right? Being more creative, um, integrating, like you said, business services, uh, if, if <laughs> to the extent that they mm. are available, like don't, don't make me go to the business and ask for this or that, like make it available as an API or a service and, you know, and, and give me these building blocks so that I can, you know, when I, I code when I have to, right? Like it, it becomes a different mentality of like, I'm coding all the time. It's like, no, code only when you have to and make that code count. You know, I think that's, that's something you've kind of helped me to understand about this, which I, which makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's about, I mean, how many times do you want to build a technology stack, right? That's, that's super complicated. And if you're building like a, the next killer app or, or the, the next big thing, then yes, you should do it with professional engineers that know what they're doing. But a lot of the, you know, demand that we see in enterprises is just day by day apps, just just the little things that yeah. add up and get your business going. And ultimately, I think this is what made SAP so successful in the first place, that it was super easy to develop, you know, custom applications without having to really be a master of of all the technology underneath. And I think that's that's where we need to get back to to say all if, if if I have the opportunity within my business to not just only, you know, always roll out the priority one applications, but all the applications that would bring my business forward, then then and sorry, my French now, but uh, it's a game changer. We're changing. The uh, game. We got the game <laughs> changer. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I bring it up here now, but it's it's true. It's true. It's you're thanks, just saying. Thanks, thanks, Bill McDermott, for that one. Uh, thanks for the vocabulary. Yeah. Oh, and that's... Then how many kittens did I kill now? <laughs> uh, I, do, <laughs> I, I do hear some meowing in the background, um, yeah. some resigned meowing. Okay, I have a really hard question for you. Uh, oh, okay. So when you watch all this low code app driver stuff from the main stage, uh, as as a company that I know has invested a lot in these technologies and I, and I know to, uh, having talked with some of your customers, how much they love working with some of these tools, like, like, like we said, we've seen a post on the community network about this, about feeling almost liberated by some of these tools from like old school ABAP type. Uh, okay, so you have built all this. Do you feel threatened by these announcements? Uh, you know, okay, we're getting kind of pushed aside by, by SAP mainstreaming these tools. Or do you feel more like this validates the entire space and that that's good for everyone because the more emphasis that customers have on this, the more everyone's going to benefit. What is your view on that? Yeah, I think it's somewhere in between, right? Every marketing book 101 would tell you that um, it's always good to ride in the jet stream of the of the leader in the space. So if if SAP keeps you know evangelizing and 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 you know educating the market on the need, then that definitely is important. And then obviously it's up to us to explain uh, how is our approach different or or. And not to say better, but just different. And why does it matter? And 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 I agree on on the buyer perspective. It's typically going to be like, okay, this is very much the same. Um, so we really need to to drive that home. That where are we different, right? And and so I'm 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 not that concerned at the moment. Um, I I think what I've learned over the last two years is that um, as soon as we can you know, let our product speak for itself. And the people that were actually the ones that are using the product at the end of the day are getting involved into conversation, then then we're up to a good start. Um, so it's always just, you know, getting a, a, a seat at the table. And at that perspective, it helps to, to get SAP, you know, educate the market on that front. But I'm very confident in, in Neptune's ability to, yeah, to, out execute if you will or just perform on that level and continue what we have started and and, and i know that as you said um we have a platform that really feels very natural and easy to use to to the anticipated developer uh, ecosystem out there and and if we can just get the word out I, I think that will give us a try and then we can yeah 
let the end users decide which platform um, um, is the one they want to pick up. Yeah. Game on, basically. So <laughs> yeah. Down to ga- yeah. Game yeah, on. I'm, I'm, ga- I'm game. I mean, it's, it's. I mean, there's no other way, right? If if we're we're now competing in this no code low code space with a lot of the, you know, the friendly analysts I uh, call the most uh, disruptive trend this year in enterprise software, and and I would tend to agree. Um. So yeah, if if you're afraid of the competition, then then you're already lost, right? Um, so I just yeah. hope that SAP keeps it fair and square. I mean, we all know what happens if if there is a something on SAP's price list for for the field. It's by definition always the best thing. Um. So let's just see how how that how that yeah how the market reacts to this. But I'm not afraid. No. Cool. Not at all. So we got to talk about free tier. Uh. So yeah. So the thing the thing is like. I'm a lot less, one of my beliefs that I try to propagate is not to let vendors have us chasing our tails all the time about so-called news at at conferences because often announcements don't really matter until customers embrace them and see value. So I try to step away from being so vendor driven all the time and try to Mm -hmm. look at what issues really matter on the ground. But the free tier announcement is, is a fairly big deal, partially because it is immediately available this isn't something that's coming like next spring it's right. it's available now um and and basically what this is is the long awaited uh free tier for uh, btp extended to individual developers which is really the key because it was always about where are the individual developers and in all of this sap has done a better job in recent years of making these things available to smaller partners who have a bit of budget and resources, but w- where's the individual developer? That's been a really big problem, and and it looks like SAP's taken a big step. Um, but I I do want to make clear from my viewpoint that SAP developers who are happy about this announcement owe a lot of outspoken individuals some thanks because there's a lot mm. of a lot of people that we that were once SAP mentors or connected to that program or other community members. You know, I can't name them all in this podcast. I did on Twitter. Um, they, they were very vocal about this for a long time, and I think they were instrumental in in this. And um, I spoke with um, Thomas Grassel, who is a real gentleman, and he's he's very he's he's got a high level position now in community developer, and he basically said to me last week that there was a big um, flare up last year about this and you were kind of part of it too. Uh, you were on a podcast with Dan Hallett about it, I believe, uh, you know, we're talking through some of these issues. Um, and, and he basically said to me, we got to get this right. And we're, we're going to take, we decided to take some time and get it right. And that's my impression of this announcement is that it really had this comprehensive view of like, we've thought through these issues. They weren't just floating it. They, they nailed it down this time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and late is always better than never, right? I think that's a German saying that we have, yeah. so that's fine. And and yeah, um, I mean, having been an evangelist for all of this for so many times within SAP, I, I sometimes you know, really were were frustrated by the fact that, you know, the, the evangelist doesn't doesn't count in its own in his own country. It's always, you know, the people from the outside that suddenly say, But you have to do this and then everybody Oh yeah, you're right and and, and you can yeah talk as much as you want internally and it doesn't have the same effect but but they really did get it right on many levels now really first of all i think it's value-based pricing in my point of view because get get the developers enabled via the online courses and the free tier so that they can really do the stuff and once they start using it productively that's when you can rightfully charge for it because there is value for what you're delivering but that's a smart move because ultimately you're really breaking down that barrier of of getting the the whole developer ecosystem enabled on these topics so that they can make a living with it without charging them so that's that's smart and then the other thing and i know that a lot of the mentors were also very vocal about this is what they finally did is that there is a smooth transition from that free tier to the paid offering. Now, right. in the early days, it was separated. There was the trial environment and the productive environment. And if I started to build something on trial, there was no way I can ever move it to the real thing. 
um, and, and, and that was also taken away. So I have this now. I can really start developing something. And once I said, yeah, I got my MVP ready, I want to, you know, get it out there, then you have that transition phase. So as you said, the devil is always in the detail, but they really, from what I'm reading at the moment, they really uh, uh, cracked that nut. No. Yeah, I put out a tweet kind of acknowledging those who who have been vocal about this, but also saying, you know, now to go build some apps and break down the remaining barriers, right? Like figure out where the barriers still are, if there are any, and, and break them down because we still have to find out. But for the most part, you know, I checked the Twitter stream of some of the people that I know would be most critical. Uh, folks like Tobias Hoffman, who's been advocating mm -hmm. for this for mm -hmm. a long time. He's enthusiastic. Chris Payne yeah. from Australia. He said, was this your whoa? What what the F was that moment in the SAP Tech Keynote? Or was it placing SAP Integration Suite into free tier? Either way, I know if we'd been at a physical conference, this would probably have been the first discussion we'd have had at the bar. So yep. uh, I think that's the yeah. kind of thing SAP SAP wants to see. And, uh, you know, I made kind of a list of things that I think SAP is doing well right now on the tech side. And I think they've, you know, they're, they're, they're making progress with what developer engagement I think should really look like. And you see, you see that when you see people like Thomas Young and Rich Hellman, who are still very publicly involved, these guys have, you know, I've talked about this, but they have such enormous mm. credibility. Mm. And when I see SAP putting a lot of trust in them like that, I find that very encouraging because what they show is that those guys have shown how to evolve. They've shown all the oboppers out there how to embrace these technologies and how to how to take things forward. And I think that's something that SAP has done really, really well in the last couple of years with so-called developer advocates and whatever. Um, Grossel and I know Craig Schmehel has been involved and other people, mm -hmm. but I think these are people that are very thoughtful and have really taken to heart <laughs> some of the some of the kinds of things that you've said to them internally, what I've said externally, what a bunch of other people have said. And um, I think we're seeing some signs of that now. The remaining interesting question, which I was talking about with SAP last week during my briefings is, how do you engage the the developers who are not part of the ecosystem, right? So I would argue that SAP, I would, I would argue that SAP's done an above average, I, th I think they've exceeded expectations in terms of upskilling the classic OBOPER and getting them excited about the journey. Where I think SAP has struggled is around engaging developers that are not part of that sort of classic SAP development community. And, you know, to SAP's defense, I think a lot of enterprise software companies struggle with this, right? Because, you know, it's it's difficult to to reach young developers and get them excited about an enterprise software, right? Because it's like, Oh, that's a great app, but let's have a little talk about security, compliance, governance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, oh man, I should have just built an app for the, for the iPhone or whatever, you know? That's how you can cut all innovation. Just bring up the topic of data security. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Let's not do it. But, but you said so many, many smart things and I'm happy that you're calling out uh, Tobias and Chris, because those were the ones that really came to mind as well. Um, and yes, I um, worked always very closely with, with Thomas Grussell's team back in the day. And, and, and we have been all fighting for the same things. So I, I would agree that SAP has done a lot of things right this time around. And, and let me just point that out so that nobody says we're you know, and not observing this. So first of all, I have to say that the whole mobile experience, you know, to build my agenda and everything, that was such a smooth ride this year around. Like, like seriously, it's they finally cracked that one. Um, and that was really frustrating back in the time. Uh, another thing that I want to mention is is so much value add is that we have real time Q and A during those sessions. You know, you have people that finally know what has been talked about, and they can take the questions right away. So that is super amazing. Um, um, so they're really moving in the right directions. And just seeing the developer keynote, I mean, as you said, people like Tom Young and all the new guys on the team, DJ, not not to forget about DJ uh, Vitaly yeah. and all those people. I mean, they have such so much street credibility. The people know them, the people trust in what they say. They they know there's always, you know, lots of value uh, and things to learn. I mean, give them the stage and they will win over developer hearts. Um, and those are the right people that, as you said, you need more of. So you need to look at the next generation. Um, so maybe just mentioning this because it was something that I remember was really big, like two, three years down the line. 
there was always some announcements on open source and 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 and, and this time around there was zero and i think open source is one of those ways where you can actually get a little bit of you know mm -hmm. exposure in the non sap developer ecosystems um, so I, I just hope they don't completely forget about this, but I think it, it's truly important um, that they, yeah, as you said, are making sure that they find ways on how to attract the the next gen, um, the, the outside external developers. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you mentioned DJ because he's done some really innovative live live stuff. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that we could call out. So if you haven't been called out, like mm. please don't please don't yeah, take it personal it's 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 just oversights on our part because it's, it's truly mm. community effort with stuff like this but you know one thing that's really interesting matthias i talked with grassl about last week is how to to be honest and i think a lot of people listening to this already know this is that sap tech ed was really headed for some some close scrutiny and reinvention prior to pandemic times and mm. you know i think in particular the las vegas event there was this question around like if you really want to be an inclusive developer community, can you really have an annual conference at a expensive Vegas hotel, you know, and, mm -hmm. and hope to expand your community? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, what, what Grassel told me, which comes as no surprise, is that these online versions of, of, of tech ed have really reached a lot of people that would not have ever made it to, to Vegas. And so it's interesting how... Yeah you know, the, the grim uh, realities of pandemic life have also provoked uh, people to move out of their comfort zone. And and I think that was a little bit inevitable anyway, um, but now it's really happening. And, and, and last year before Tech Ed, they actually talked with me because I'm like this, you know, rabble rouser for more inclusive formats. And they talked with me about some of their plans and it was really ambitious. And um, the best part of it, I thought, was some of the live streaming stuff and the you know, the so-called channel one, which is kind of a drop in area, all these expert QAs you talked about that are live and, you know, really trying to make the most out of this interactive format. And it was interesting because he told me one of the big things from last year to this year, they changed is last year, they were so ambitious with all these, like so many tracks and sessions. And they realized, I think rightly so cut down on all the content and focus more on the community engagement around the show. And so anyway, I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how they take all these lessons going forward, because I know they don't want to go back to more like events that exclude people at the expense of the inclusion that they've been able to foster. Now, could they do kind of a combination of both and, and do more local regionalized events? I would expect we'll hear more about co jams getting revived going forward oh, and things like yeah. that. Um, but anyway, I think I think a lot of the thinking on this has been really interesting for SAP. And, you know, the other thing I told SAP, which which I think is sort of interesting, is that they may have an opportunity right now because alluding to some of your big themes, one of the things that younger generation developers, I think, really care about are the sort of purpose driven angles to all this. Um, you know, SAP has an opportunity to to be kind of a globalist voice around issues like climate change, mm -hmm. sustainability, things that matter to people. And um, and I think it's really interesting because big tech, which used to be so sexy a number of years ago, oh, I want to work for Google someday. I want to work for Facebook someday. Now it's kind of like I don't know if I want to work for mm -hmm. these companies. You know, like they have these monoliths, and they. Maybe they ha cause more sort of negative impact on society. I mean, you, you wouldn't have heard that conversation like seven, ten years ago, but now you're hearing it. And maybe there's a big opportunity for SAP there. And I think one thing I picked up on from Grassel, and I think he's seeing that too, is, okay, so now you have these really nice themes around climate change, sustainability, and so forth. Now can you start providing tooling around that so we're not just working around a community that cares about that. We're, we're actually building tools that help me monitor carbon emissions or help me swap clean energy sources or so so can we get developers involved in the tooling around all of that to make it real for companies who want to have a better chance of managing what we call externalities or whatever these things are um, a lot of that functionality hasn't been built yet it's not part of core erp as it, or erp was originally designed and I think it's going to need to be somehow. And so maybe maybe that's that's a hook that allows SAP to reach young developers who are looking for, yeah, I'd like to be involved in something that matters, like building stuff that matters. And that's a really interesting opportunity for SAP going forward. No, absolutely. And I would attribute it to the, to the younger generation that we now see on the board 
um, um, they come with this with the thinking that they care about this. Uh, I really believe it's very authentic. Um, um, what is coming from Thomas Sauer, I think, and others when they talk about sustainability and, and, and yep. what they're doing on that front. Um, and as you said, it, it it resonates with with the with the new breed of developers that are more looking in, in, into purpose-driven opportunities than, than just money, right? So definitely, I think if it's one thing that we learned that perks is is not something that will make people stick. It's 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 culture and purpose. Um, and, and both, I think, we've seen in a very positive light um, because what I truly enjoy is that um, with all this virtual tech hit, you get to see the people talking that actually do the job and not just some um, SVPs, you know, to just say, okay, Present, prepare my presentation. I'm gonna get some airtime and present it. No, you, you you're seeing the people that drive the stuff. Um, they get very very active. And at the end of the day, this is what I can definitely say. Uh, with all my years at SAP, is uh, there's so many genuine and smart people. Um, and and if you if you empower them to to you know just do their job, then 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 you're really up to something. And I think they're really representing SAP in, in in a very positive way. So that's that's a really, really, really good thing. So it's not that scripted tech ad, you know, um, please don't go off script. It's it's really just, it's a lot of it is live on channel one, as you said, not everything runs perfect all the time, but it just makes it so much more fun to watch and, and so much more rewarding. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think when you have a world that is so divide, divided around, you know whether it's the digital divide or or the, r- the rise of very ugly mm. nationalist nationalist mm. movements and political uh di- you know divides that are exacerbated by algorithms that feed on amoral virality and things like that i think sap can be a very very important voice and i actually that i i'm very critical of the company in certain ways but i think that's one of their greatest strengths and i i like that they led with some of that at teched i believe it's very sincere um where where I do think SAP needs to be sort of I guess held to account is follow through. Follow through yep. is where yep. things get follow through is where it gets difficult, right? And so, you know, whether it's including smaller partners or whether it's, you know, making it easy for developers now that they built these apps to get them onto the app store and commercialize it because let's face it, none of this matters unless these apps get built, you know. Um, you know, in, in the end you, you can judge the 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 health of an ecosystem by how 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 many how many of these apps are built and 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 how many are in active use. So, I would I guess encourage everyone listening to continue to be vocal. And if you don't feel comfortable being vocal, then ping people <laughs> like 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 us that are willing to try to air these things out and and let us know what the issues are and um and and don't be afraid because i think it's really important because that's where sap sometimes can get tripped up because sometimes the leadership when you talk with them they're not always clear on what the obstacles are on the ground or where the resistance is from say salespeople who don't want to share partner products or a region that's kind of doing its own thing so that's why we have to kind of keep pressing and that's not just sap by the way that's pretty much any any vendor um but but part of what sap has this love hate thing going on i think where they've empowered a community to be very vocal with a lot of vocal user groups there's a consequence to that too which is the user groups are going to speak up and they're mm-hmm. going to keep mm-hmm. they're going to keep bringing these issues up and and until until they're followed through but i do think that sap has a chance to become a very important global voice they've been talking about this stuff for years i mean sustainability i remember kagerman talking about this you know, before it was cool, you know, SAP has cared about these issues for a long time. And and now is the time to kind of engage developers around them. And I think SAP does, it's not too late. Like, like you and I were saying, like, sometimes it's like, oh, things move slow. I don't think it's too late for SAP on this stuff. I think they can do it right now. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, the, the customers are typically a, a little bit behind. Um, I think COVID slowed down a lot of the big decision making anyway. Yep. So it's definitely the right time, and uh, I would give credit to SAP. I mean, they they really made this a big part of of their external messaging for the last years. You know, to an extent where others m- may would have thought, you know, besides sustainability, where's the innovation? Um, um, but they said no. We we believe that this is uh, the right thing to do, 
um, or also Christian Klein, right? I mean, he was under pressure. Um, um, the stock market was not really, you know, uh, being quite fair to SAP, but he said, no, we have the right strategy. We have the right people. And these are the, to the topics that we put as a, a priority. And, and right now I would say he, he was right, right? And, and and he just did what what he believed in and what needed to be done. And and from that perspective, yeah, it's it's all about execution. And I think that's that's kind of the bottom line that we always had in those previous conversations, right? You can, um, it's it doesn't matter what what you present or um you know you need to follow follow through and and walk the talk. And that's when things happen. Yeah, and it Indeed. may take sometimes a little bit longer than expected. I'm just looking at my list of topics. I think we we pretty much uh, covered all of them. Uh, I, I had the phrase cloud agnostic on here because that's been a big point of emphasis for SAP. Um, I think they've done a, a good job of that after some perceptions that they were particularly close to Azure. I think they've um, backed mm. off of that. Um, the other thing is that there are, there are definitely some news stories we didn't cover. I think we have a bit of a disclaimer there that – uh, that there's a lot of this stuff and it's all in the execution, but there is some big learning announcements that came out. Yeah. Uh, SAP's making a pretty big fanfare around a new chapter for SAP learning uh, and making SAP learning available to individuals uh, through the new SAP learning site that's been launched. So that's a really interesting thing. I need to check that out more before I comment a lot about that, but I will say that Max Vet, Max Essel, who's in charge and chief learning officer, uh, he was very good about having some dialogue on this earlier this year, and I think he's really interested in it, in in making SAP learning more intuitive and more sort of geared towards the individual. Um, he he put up with a pretty searing critique of mine because I still have a lot of bones to pick around certification and how that's handled, but I've kind of, it's back burner type stuff. I've let it go. But anyway, he was a real gentleman yes. about it. And I think, I think he and his team are doing some pretty cool stuff. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff we haven't covered and it's only for, well, this, we envision this is kind of like a, the same kind of thing we would do at a bar or like, you know, outdoors, like, like trying to decompress. And so we're not going to be comprehensive here. So, yeah. So is this a call for action to reassemble the certification five? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know it's going to be a little tough with like debt yeah. and retirement and yeah. stuff. I no, we've I, I had to give that up. Um, that's an area where I was never able to convince SAP of of the need for like that kind of mastery level certificate. So I had to give it up. But you know that that doesn't mean that SAP is not doing some other cool stuff on the learning side. Certification is only one piece of that, and. Anyway, I think they're doing some really interesting thinking around continuous learning and how to make that real for individuals. And so let's see where that leads. But again, I haven't looked at the new site, so I can't really say much about it yet. Yeah, yeah. No, I also picked that up. Um, I think that they came a long way with Open SAP. But I, yeah. I recall from the session with Max that I, I, I listened into, what I like is to say, yes, it's Right now we have a lot of great content, but just you know this this guidance on on, on the learning map um, is is missing. But he is he seemed determined to to add that piece, you know, that for people that are really you know coming fresh, that there's a little bit more guardrails on helping them navigate through all of the different learning offerings and bring them all together. And I think yeah, this is this is what I've always believed in. If you have free access to the tooling free learning opportunities, then you're up to something because then you're setting a really, really low entry barrier and a really low learning curve. Yep. And that's how you can excite people. And then if you have role models out there like Tammy and others that, you know, just show how you can pay it forward and, and, and do community contribution. If you can, you know, revive that community spirit that all brought us into this, then yeah, the, it's, SAP is, is still big uh, and they can still do great things going forward. Yeah. That's Tammy Palace, by the way, who just liked one of my tweets during our conversation. Oh. So, Hi, Tammy. <laughs> so, yeah, she's she's always out there somewhere getting something done. So, yeah, I just saw that she got into the ASAC Hall of Fame. And yeah, it was obviously 
very well deserved. So let's wrap it up for all the uh, with a shout out to all the community heroes out there that you know behind the scenes and all the time continuously no educate people and pay it forward. That's the type of stuff we want to see continuing in the SAP world. No doubt this podcast was for all of you guys. You know who you are too because <laughs> you know you remember what those old school events were like and all the different things that we got up to. So this one's for you guys. So hope you enjoyed it. Awesome. I think that's a wrap then. Uh, thanks yeah. so much for taking the time. I know you have to hit the road, so yeah. drive safely. Uh, as always, okay. John, a real pleasure to talk to you. And yeah, until next time.